Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the We Count Digging Deeper uh, series um, webinar on the metric society and the unmeasurable. We're really pleased to have you here today. And I'd like to start our meeting with our land acknowledgement. OCAD University acknowledges the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians of the land on which we stand and create. I'd also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Thank you, Vera, and thank you everyone that has made this possible today. Um, and I wonder, okay, great. So uh, we will have all of the panelists uh, visible, correct? Wonderful, okay. So um, Virginia and Stefan, uh, I feel like this is an early birthday present for me. Um, I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you both. And I wish we had more than the time available today because there's so many things to discuss. Um, but I, I'm not going to, given that there are so many things to discuss, I'm, I hope it's okay if I'm not going to spend a great deal of time introducing you. <laughs> um, and partly because you need no introduction. Uh, we have the bios on the site and anyone can search for your names <laughs> in any search engine to find your amazing contributions to this domain. Um, so, I'm going to proceed directly to your presentations uh, and we're going to begin with Stefan. So S Stefan, if you would like to share your screen. And as Vera mentioned, we're going to have about 10 minutes uh, for both Stefan and Virginia to talk about their perspective on this particular very relevant uh, domain. And um, I'll pass it over to you, Stefan. Thanks, Jutta, for, uh, for the introduction, also for the invitation, and welcome uh, to all the listeners and, and viewers. I have a very short presentation, which is basically summarizing a book uh, that I have written a few years ago. It was published in 2019, in, also in English. It's called The Metric uh, Society. And in that book, I start with a very famous uh, example you probably all uh, know. Uh, that is uh, the so-called uh, social credit system in China, a system that is still under development and we don't know exactly how it will look in the end. But it's a spectacular, uh, even revolutionary uh, system that tries to basically collect as many information on uh, individuals as possible and to attach a specific score measuring basically the trustworthiness or the credibility of an individual uh, on each uh, citizen. And uh, that score in the end should determine their opportunities on the housing market, the labor market, at the edu education market, or even at the uh, credit market. So the, the life chances they get uh, uh, in the future. And uh, of course, this is a very grim and maybe extreme example, but there are other examples that you also could use uh, from Western countries where we do not have a combination of digitization and authoritarian rule, but where we also have types of measurements, uh, forms of uh, yeah, quantitative rank ordering. This is an example I encountered a few years ago when I was uh, in the US uh, in Boston we were looking for a babysitter and the babysitter website linked us to another website because uh, they said, so if you uh, ask a babysitter to come to your place, uh, then uh, it's quite a risky undertaking to hand over your own kids uh, to a complete stranger. Why don't you do a reputation check? And there's a website called mylife.com where you can type in the name and a zip code and then it uses all public information, information from government, social, and uh, also uh, media uh, sources uh, to calculate a specific so-called repu reputation score. Uh, it also uses uh, criminal records, uh, the credit score people have, uh, but also 
personal profiles on uh, social media. So it takes a while, but in the end, you get a score between zero and five, and even so a green or a red sign of uh, telling you whether this is a trustworthy uh, person with high reputation or not. And of course, uh, people probably tend to take those babysitters with a very high uh, score. And uh, there were interesting testimonials on that uh, website. So Luisa, for example, I don't know whether they are true or not, but you, Luisa said, you'd be crazy to rent someone an apartment not looking at the reputation score first. It saved me tons of trouble. Ricardo said, I declined a job after I did a background check on the guy who was going to be my supervisor. And best is Larry. I felt a lot better about my daughter's new boyfriend after I checked the reputation score. So it can be very useful to have that information basically in all areas of life. In my book, I try to uh, describe a mega trend of quantification, of course, being related uh, to the digitization of uh, society. So we have uh, masses of uh, data, tons of data, which allow now to capture, to monitor, uh, to collect uh, uh, people's uh, 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 yeah, data and individual uh, behavior. There's even a quantification code to think of uh, uh, the availability of ratings, rankings, scores, stars, uh, likes, uh, grades, uh, and so on. Uh, when you uh, visit a city and you go to a restaurant, you are asked afterwards to evaluate it with a, or to give stars uh, you know, in hotels. It's basically the same. So in all areas of life. The second development that could be um, um, spelled out as a driver of quantification is the process of economization. Sometimes people talk about neoliberalization, uh, but here uh, uh, of key importance is the populariz popularization of concepts like transparency, accountability, and evidence-based uh, policy. Uh, and they all use indicators and numbers uh, basically to make government intervention and policies more efficient and uh, also to develop uh, certain performance key benchmarks in order to find out whether an organization works good or uh, less good. Also in the university context, this has become very important. And of course, if something is uh, quantifiable, then we quite often assume it's also comparable. And uh, if you look at data, I mean, we have now things from basically all areas of life, performance, work performance, but also educational performance, health, uh, activity, trustworthiness, uh, mobility. Uh, you can go on and on. So in basically all areas of life, there's this kind of drive of uh, quantification. I'm a sociologist and I interpret data as, uh, data as uh, symbols of uh, distinction because they tell you where a person, a product, a service, or an organization is situated uh, within a context of a specific uh, uh, value system or system of uh, worth. And uh, it makes people basically, it instigates a specific type of investive uh, status work, how I call that, that uh, makes people striving for good numbers. So in academia, we know that quite well. We have... Uh, uh, citation index the ind indices uh, and impact uh, scores telling us where we stand and how good uh, we are. There are four effects that come uh, with the language of uh, numbers. So they change our understanding of work and quality. It's uh, not the case that uh, numbers simply reflect a reality outside. They also reformat uh, uh, the reality outside, so they give up a specific type of reading uh, how society uh, looks like, so it's important which numbers we use, which metrics uh, come to the fore and uh, uh, will be used in public communication. Second, uh, I said it before, so if you have numbers, then you are automatically in the world of comparison, so there's a comparative dispositive that comes along uh, with uh, numbers, uh, 
uh, given that we have now an age index in social in, in sciences, so measuring basically uh, publication uh, impact, you can now compare uh, Virginia and myself in terms of uh, uh, scientific success. Uh, but you could also compare we, me with a Chinese uh, physician or uh, people working in very different scientific uh, areas. So it makes it easier to compare. Uh, in America, you say numbers can travel, so they decontextualize information and you can take them somewhere else. It's also a competitive mode, which we enter. So there's a universalization of competition because you can now always distinguish between better or worse, more or less. And that leads ultimately to a hierarchization and maybe a generation of uh, difference. Um, and of course, uh, this is not always done by people. So it's not uh, a human exercise, but very often delegated to uh, algorithms. So there's an algorithmic uh, power, power of nomination, uh, uh, meaning that uh, very often these procedures and calculations are done uh, automatically. Here's an example of a so-called health uh, score. So I could uh, talk at length about uh, that, but it's a Swiss uh, health score of Dakadu. Uh, it's called, and it consists of uh, three different areas. So it's basically uh, proper health uh, data, but it's also activities, uh, sports, but it's also a uh, lifestyle. And it gives you a score between zero and uh, 1,000. And if you think about health, then uh, if in, in the conventional or classic mode, you would go to a doctor and he would tell you you're ill or not. Uh, and uh, you would have a very binary system, it's not that extreme in practice because you always have uh, 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 certain problems, health problems, uh, also ongoing health problems. Uh, but here uh, you come into a situation where you can maximize your health uh, at a specific scale. And it also tells you if you are better or uh, worse than you were before. So if you had a level of 750, and you go down to 671, then you immediately are encouraged to do more and to do uh, better. Uh, this uh, firm, Dakadu, they uh, promote this kind of health uh, score with a comparison to uh, uh, stock rating at the stock exchange, uh, because they say it's like uh, a personal stock quote of your personal health and uh, well being in real time, similar to a stock quote on a stock exchange. So it's a very specific mentality that is uh, promoted here. And what I would claim is that uh, uh, this kind of new data regime does not replace the old inequality regime, but it uses increasingly data uh, uh, as uh, symbolic capital and uh, you are basically uh, forced to enter a type of reputation management based on numerical data or on uh, metrics uh, that also instills investive behavior and an entrepreneurial orientation. Does a uh, kind of rationalization of status processes come about with the use of number? Some people claim the system might be fairer uh, because uh, the more you know about an individual and the better you are able uh, to basically observe and monitor uh, the uh, the effective behavior, so the, the better it becomes. And uh, I think Virginia will argue into the same direction, so not necessarily, because we know that there are very strong discriminatory biases within that uh, system, because they have a specific type of uh, 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 normality assumption that is very often hidden and not explicit. Just think about the health uh, score. Uh, we have problematic feedback group loops, meaning that very often these types of, uh, uh, of models, of algorithmic uh, models, do not learn from reality, but uh, they are able to format reality according to the model's assumptions. We have situations of uh, exclusion, 
and uh, what Virginia Eubanks calls digital poor houses, she will tell about <laughs> that a bit more, I guess, uh, so I will not go into detail. We have very strong winner takes all effects. Uh, so uh, high market concentrations, uh, think about uh, the uh, rating of uh, restaurants or hotels. So if you have five stars, you are listed on top and most attention will go to the top five or 10 on, uh, on, a, on a list, if you look for that. The same with a babysitter, a person that uh, scores 3.5 will probably get hardly any or very few offerings from parents looking for a babysitter. Whereas if you have a four of 4.5 or a five, you are, have a much better market uh, position. So it's a concentration on the top due to the high level of transparency. And we also have problems of so-called super scores. These are scores uh, that uh, uh, are like the Chinese uh, social credit score that uh, uh, are uh, amalgamated from different areas of life and then give simply one number to one uh, person. Uh, but we also have uh, super scores that uh, come from uh, one specific area like uh, credit score and are used in other areas of life. So if the credit score becomes important uh, for uh, booking a holiday or uh, uh, renting a car or looking for, for a flat. And what I claim in that book is that this kind of, uh, of new uh, uh, quantification also creates uh, social divisibility in terms of uh, identification and uh, making individuals uh, distinctive uh, from others. So it becomes more and more difficult to create collectivities uh, because people are then recognized only on the basis on uh, the bundle uh, of, uh, of data. I think this is a very important development. And even here, some people in the insurance sector, for example, they claim it's fairer. They even want that. They want to be judged by their actual uh, driving performance when using their car, not uh, uh, according to uh, the street they live in or the, the car they drive or the professions they have, but according to their actual driving performance. And uh, so it becomes more and more difficult to organize uh, collective uh, interest. And uh, my claim would be that we move away from uh, a situation of uh, uh, struggle of classes where the distribution of power or, uh, or wealth are important uh, to a competition of uh, individuals or different organizational units like universities, uh, schools, uh, and uh, so on. This was my short input. Thanks for listening. And I'm looking forward to Virginia's presentation, and of course, to our discussion. And th thank you very much, Stefan. And perhaps what we'll do um, now is move directly to Virginia and because we'll have questions and discussion after both um, of you have offered your perspectives. So uh, Virginia, do you want to, and I understand that you won't be using slides, but using anecdotes. Yeah, so I just wanna start by Thanking everyone, um, particularly at OCAD U, so uh, Yuta and Gloria and David as well for doing all the hard work of making sure you can hear us and see us and transcript us and um, all that business. Thanks so much to our ASL interpreters for being here as well. Um, and I'm super excited to engage in conversation with folks who um, are here in the audience and with uh, Yuta and Stefan as well. So I'm gonna keep my comments really short. Um, and as Yuta um, uh, explained, I, um, I often find conversations about technology and social justice and ethics to, um, that they often get really abstract. And what I'd like to do instead or offer instead is to tell the stories of some of the people I spoke to when I was um, researching my reporting my last book, which is called Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile, Police, and Punish the Poor. Um, and I dedicate the book to um, a little girl named Sophie Stipes um, who, had, who had some pretty severe cerebral palsy. And when she was six, she received a letter from the state of Indiana 
that explained that she'd be losing her Medicaid because she had, quote, failed to cooperate in establishing eligibility, end quote, for the program. So this happened at a moment where her parents had finally found the kind of support she needed to thrive. So she was um, sort of gaining weight on pace with her age for the first time in her life, um, thanks to a life-saving feeding tube. Um, and she was learning to walk for the first time. Um, so the Stipes family uh, was caught up in this attempt to automate the eligibility process for all of the welfare programs in the state of Indiana. So in 2006, then Governor Mitch Daniels signed a 1.34 billion, that's billion with a B, billion dollar contract with this consortium of high tech companies that included IBM and ACS or affiliated computer systems um, to create a system that replaced the hands-on work of local or county welfare caseworkers with online applications and private regionalized call centers. And the result was 1 million benefits denials in just the first three years of this experiment um, this was a 54% increase um, from the three years before the experiment. And generally, uh, most people were uh, rejected for this catch-all reason, failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. All that meant was that someone somewhere in the process had made a mistake. So the applicant could have forgotten a signature somewhere in this very, very extensive paperwork a call center worker could have made a mistake in applying policy, or the computer system itself could have made an error. Like for example, the system didn't recognize pay checks as proof of income, it only recognized pay stubs. So if you had checks instead of stubs, it, um, it rejected your evidence of employment and, um, and that could get you um, rejected for failure to cooperate in establishing eligibility. But all the failure to cooperate notice did was tell you that there was an error. It didn't tell you what the error was. Um, and because the system had severed the relationship between applicants um, and local caseworkers, the system virtually guaranteed that the burden of finding and fixing any mistake in the system, um, even if it wasn't your fault, fell squarely and solely on the shoulders of those people who were requesting services, who were some of the state's most vulnerable people. Um, so this created enormous hardship for poor and working families in Indiana. Um, and in the United States, Indiana, people from Indiana are called Hoosiers. Um, so it created um, an extraordinary uh, burden for poor and working class Hoosiers. And Kim Stipes, Sophie's mom, told me when I was doing my reporting on automating inequality, she said, during that time, my mind was muddled because it was all so stressful. All my focus was in getting Sophie back on that Medicaid and then crying afterwards because everyone was calling us white trash and moochers. It was just like being sucked up into this vacuum of nothingness. So that's story one of Indiana. Story two takes place in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Um, and there I spoke with Patrick Grebe and Angel Shepherd, who were very engaged, creative parents who nevertheless had been red flagged several times for child neglect by the county's Office of Children, Youth and Family Services. And their primary crime in the system was that they were poor. Patrick had been found guilty of child neglect, for example, when he could not afford his daughter's antibiotic prescription after an emergency room visit. Um, and so they lived in this sort of constant state of low grade terror around a new statistical model that the county was developing. It was called the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. And what the Allegheny Family Screening Tool was supposed to be able to do was predict which children might be victims of abuse or neglect sometime in the future. Um, so they lived in this fairly constant state of low grade terror that the system would target their daughter or their granddaughter for a child welfare investigation and potentially remove them to foster care. 
So that model is built on top of a data warehouse that holds, at the time of the writing of the book, held 1 billion records, more than 800 records for every resident of Allegheny County. Um, and data extracts are regularly collected from um, agencies like adult and juvenile probation, the jails and prisons, county mental health services, the state office of income maintenance, the public schools, and other agencies that primarily serve poor and working families around Pittsburgh. So the limits of that data set shape what the model is able to recognize and predict as you would imagine. So because it relies almost entirely on information that is only collected on families who reach out for help to public assistance programs, what happens is that it, um, it misses information about professional middle-class families while over-focusing on poor and working-class families. So professional middle-class families likely need just as much support and help um, raising their children as poor and working-class families, but they pay for it with, through private insurance, for example, or out of pocket. And that means that their data doesn't show up in the data warehouse, so it doesn't show up in the predictive model. So the families I spoke to, the parents that I spoke to in Allegheny County told me they felt like it was a system of poverty profiling, that the system confused poor parenting with parenting while poor, and that those were different things. Um, the model's designers and administrators at Children, Youth, and Family Services say that part of the purpose of the system is to root out bias in um, call screening, that is, who is um, reported to by mandated reporters or is reported to anonymous hotlines and how the agency decides which families to investigate and which families to sort of flag but not investigate. Um, but the models don't actually remove bias, they just move it from one place to another. So in Allegheny County, the model takes the discretion of frontline caseworkers and who are, by the way, the most working class, the most female, and the most diverse part of the social service workforce. And it, they move the discretion of those workers to the economists and data scientists who build the models. Okay, so that's Patrick and Angel um, in Allegheny County. And I wanna talk about just one more person, um, uh, Gary Boatwright. And I met Gary Boatwright in Skid Row in Los Angeles. Um, and the system I explored when I was in Los Angeles is called the Coordinated Entry System. Um, and it responds to the county's unbelievably tragic housing crisis. So at the time of the book's writing, there are roughly 58,000 un unhoused people in Los Angeles County. Um, I live in a small city in upstate New York called Troy. Uh, there are 50,000 people in my city. So my entire city plus close to 10,000 people are unhoused in Los Angeles County. Um, and the homeless count this year um, also documented a 15% increase since I wrote the book. So the um, number now stands at above 66,000 people. And something like 75% of them are completely unhoused, meaning um, they're, uh, they're completely unsheltered. They're not in emergency shelter. They're living on the sidewalk or in encampments or in cars. So coordinated entry um, comes out of a really good impulse, which is to manage the resources that the county has more efficiently and to make sure that they're matching um, need to the most appropriate resource. And how this works is um, the system assigns each unhoused person a score on a spectrum of vulnerability. And it serves those at the top of the spectrum of vulnerability very well. So those people who face really the worst consequences of homelessness, like death, emergency room visits, mental health crisis. The system also serves those um, sort of down towards the bottom of the scale, those who are least vulnerable pretty well, these folks who would, we would think of as the crisis homeless rather than the chronic homeless, folks who might just need a small investment, a short-term support to recover from something like an eviction or a foreclosure or job loss or domestic violence. 
Um, so the vulnerability of folks um, is established through this very extensive and unhoused people would say very intrusive survey um, called the VI SPDAT, that is V-I-S-P-D-A-T, which stands for the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. Um, and it asks questions like, do you ever do things that may be considered risky, like exchange sex for drugs or money, run drugs for someone, have unprotected sex with someone you don't know, share needles, anything like that? And have you threatened to or tried to harm yourself or anyone else in the past year? So some unhoused people, like Monique's tally, one of the people, one of the people I spoke to in Skid Row, call coordinated entry a gift from God because it succeeds in getting a small number of people into appropriate housing, um, and potentially more quickly than than before. And at the time of the book's publication, coordinated entry had matched just over 9,000 people with some kind of housing resource. Now that doesn't mean a, a, an apartment key, um, that could just mean a couple hundred dollars to help with the move, but 9,000 people had been served by the system. But at the time that I wrote the book, there were 20,000 people in the system who had been surveyed, had gone through this very extensive um, and some would say intrusive survey and had been classified, had been given a vulnerability score, but who never received any resources. People like Gary Boatwright, who is strong enough to survive, but not able to get back on his feet by himself. Um, so Gary was classified as not being vulnerable enough to merit immediate assistance, but not, being, but not stable enough to be served by the time-limited resources of rapid rehousing. So because he was in the middle um, of that scale, he cycled between bouts of homelessness and incarceration for about a decade. Um, so from his point of view, the problem wasn't his comparative vulnerability, wasn't comparing him and his situation to the people who lived in the encampments in Skid Row around him. Rather, it was simpler math, not so complex. There's not enough housing in Los Angeles for the county's 66,000 unhoused people. So he told me, people like me, who are somewhat higher functioning, were not getting housing. It's just another way of kicking the can down the road. In order to house the homeless, you have to have available units. Show me the units, otherwise you're just lying. So my greatest fear about these systems is that by acting as a kind of empathy override, um, by uh, outsourcing some of our most difficult social decisions to computers, um, these tools radically limit our political vision of what a caring community and a caring society looks like. like. It absolves us of the responsibility to care for one another. Um, so what I want to say briefly in closing is I just want to mention a couple of things that the um, pandemic has made really clear about these systems. First, the, the pandemic has removed barriers to social assistance that um, many governments said were impossible to remove before. Um, so for example, um, mutual obligations, that is that you have to um, put in a certain number of hours uh, in work or volunteerism in, in, in exchange for your benefits. Um, in Australia, that kind of um, mutual obligations um, was just, um, they just rejected out of hand for about a year during COVID. Um, they also raised the rate of um, the what's called in Australia, the job seeker benefit, um, a rate that they said is, was impossible to, to, to lift. Um, and conditionality and cash transfers, like in Mexico, the Prospero system in Mexico, um, were canceled during COVID. So all of this, um, one of the things the pandemic has done is make it clear that these sort of constructions, these social constructions of what is possible are just that, they're constructions. And these systems can be changed, they can be changed radically, and they can be changed quickly. Um, but the pandemic, as all of you know, has also made many people much more vulnerable. Um, and that will continue and may in some ways even get worse as the pandemic begins to abate. Um, so for example, um, these systems have made possible things like fraud detection algorithms 
um, that or systems for tracking supposed overpayments of public benefits. Um, and I've had many people um, in government here in the United States tell me, oh, well, during the pandemic, we just lowered the barriers for getting resources. Um, and after the pandemic abates, we'll just go after everybody for fraud. Um, so there will be a new set of problems after the pandemic. And if history tells us anything, it's that the extra pressure on these systems both provides really important political opportunities to reconsider the possible, but may also deepen class divisions between people who are newly facing problems of unemployment and need for social services and those who have been persistently un or underemployed. Um, class divisions that are made, um, are solidified and made worse by, um, by gender, by race, and by um, ability status. Um, so the pandemic, I think, has made this especially visible, that um, what counts, who counts, what work counts, is a life-altering politics um, and how essential the work we do to care for, other, for each other is um, to the economy, to our society, um, and how ruthlessly we sometimes sacrifice those um, who do that kind of caring labor. Um, so I wanna wrap up there because I'm really excited to engage in this conversation, but I wanna thank you so much for your attention, for being here. I know there's many things you could have done with your um, uh, Wednesday morning. Um, and so I'm so grateful that people are here to engage in this conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Virginia, and thank you, Stefan. Um, so um, Stefan and Virginia encouraged me to ask seed questions that contextualize the work of this community, <laughs> um, those individuals that are attending, um, and the, the particular concerns that the community and the IDRC um, is, is dealing with at the moment, the challenges that, that we are attempting to address. And part of this is uh, part of our We Count project. And the, the name We Count was chosen for our project as a type of double entendre. Um, we wanted to point out the use of the word counting in the English language to mean mattering and importance. Um, and that reveals a lot about the, the culture that we're in at the moment. Um, and within that context, people with disabilities are very different from each other. Uh, they are small minorities and outliers from the perspective of quantified data, or even many um, people with disabilities cannot be represented. They are an N of one in research or other instances when counting happens. Um, this means that they're often excluded or to be included, important uniqueness is removed in the name of social justice um, and privacy. So current machine learning when used to make decisions about a population or to, or to optimize um, a, a system are bad at diversity, complexity and change, which is the lived experience of people with disabilities. Um, when, especially when the focus is on making decisions about a person as opposed to interpreting the environment. Um, combined with majority rules and statistical means decisions, uh, this leads to decisions biased against disability. The other meaning, of course, is uh, the empowerment meaning that we count, that taking over the counting and using metrics and data science to address our community concerns. Um, my greatest concern is the treatment of small minorities and outliers, uh, people that can't be represented, the ends of one. For them, representing data gaps and removing the bias from al algorithms, which are the standard approaches to address AI bias, doesn't work. It isn't enough. Do you have any suggestions for interventions? And either of you can, yeah, great, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a, a, a frequent question of if I, if I give talks so or what, what can we do about that? And uh, so my point of departure is of course that quantification uh, always leads to a kind of standardization. So a, a kind of normality assumption 
that do not does not capture uh, diversity, deviance, uh, uh, everything that is uh, not basically in the middle or not in the average of everything. And that that is of course a specific problem. Uh, uh, if we use these data and the algorithms, then of course we have to look at who is producing them, uh, who is basically sitting uh, on, on top, so who is uh, uh, making the decisions. And I think this is uh, now uh, still very much obscured. Uh, it's in the hands of, of private companies very often, or you have uh, public-private partnerships, so where uh, a state agency may use of, uh, of uh, commercial co companies. And then it uh, becomes a very hidden enterprise. So we don't really know who is making these decisions. There's some research on that uh, uh, currently underway, uh, but it shows that it's quite often very pragmatic, very technical uh, uh, approach uh, to uh, when people write uh, algorithms or program algorithms. So what is needed here is, of course, a, a proper exchange with the communities uh, concerned. Uh, so uh, they should take part in, uh, in discussing algorithms, the assumptions that go into the algorithms. They should also uh, have a political say in the use overall. And uh, what is also needed, and I think that came clearly out from uh, Virginia's talk, is uh, that you cannot fully delegate these types of decisions. So decisions about eligibility, for example, there should always be a kind of uh, human supervision abilities basically to, uh, to litigate, to question specific uh, decisions and to have a recheck uh, on the basis of more comprehensive information about uh, people that uh, is of course using a lot of men and women power. Uh, so you need more personnel to do that. I, but I think there's no way to, to get around that because otherwise you end up with a very technical procedure uh, uh, and of course, strong biases towards kind of uh, normality assumptions. So there's this great political scientist who I very much admire named Deborah Stone. Um, and she recently wrote a book called Counting, um, using the, sum, the same double en entendre that Yuta um, mentioned. And I think one of the great lines is that in that book is, um, numbers are just stories pretending they're not stories. Um, and so this idea that, um, that data provides us somehow a cleaner picture of the world, a more objective picture of the world, um, a less biased picture of the world um, is, is not true, um, one. And then the big trouble too, is that it then obscures the fact, the data obscures the fact that it's telling stories, um, telling stories about people, telling stories about the, the, the normative commitments we have in our society, how we should live. Um, and so I think really the solutions are political and not technical or legal, um, political and social and not technical or legal. Um, so there's two, the reason that I talk about what I call in the book, the digital poorhouse is to put these tools in a very long history in the United States and elsewhere of moral diagnosis, um, and um, austerity um, around how we deal with economic inequality. Um, so these are the two assumptions of many of these systems. One is austerity, the, which, um, which is a story that tells us there is not enough for everyone. And so we have to make hard decisions about who deserves help and who maybe doesn't deserve help, who maybe deserves to live on the sidewalk for 10 years in Los Angeles, who maybe deserves to lose their child because they can't afford a medication, who maybe deserves um, to not have medical care for a severely disabled child because they failed to understand a really complex piece of paperwork. I think we can move from a story of austerity to a story of abundance that says we have enough for everyone if we figure out how to share it. 
that that's what we actually want to do as a political community um, and um, that, that that is possible. And that's why I mentioned sort of the changes of the pandemic because this impossibility that there's enough to raise the rate in Australia, this possibility that there's an, enough in Mexico to um, do away with conditionality of cash transfers. Um, you know, two years ago, that was impossible. Today is possible so because it's possible because it was always possible, right? Um, so the second assumption, the, the second story that gets written into these numbers is the story of moral diagnosis. Um, so this is why I use this, this um, poor house metaphor is because one of the first things that you had to do in order to enter um, a, a, a basically an incarceration institution for the poor um, was to be diagnosed by a caseworker, right? That's where the language comes from. It's a, you are a case. You are to be investigated to figure out, right, what you're doing wrong, what is patho pathological about you that you should need, that, that you are not useful to capitalism, right? So if you're found um, that it, if it's your fault um, by the caseworker's estimation, then you're put in this incarceration institution and you have to give up your right to vote, your right to, um, to marry, your right to your children. Um, if you're um, seen as a worthy deserving person, then you might be given some kind of very meager support outside the walls of the poorhouse. The argument that I'm making in automating inequality is that we're digitizing those ideas. And by digitizing those ideas, we are producing a digital poorhouse without walls that is invisible. And because it is invisible, is much harder to fight. But I want to point out right now that that idea of moral diagnosis, that idea that poor and working class people lack um, economic resources because there's something wrong with them, is a story, and as a story, it's a lie. It is not true, empirically true, in any country in the world. Um, and so we can change that story. We can change, if we can change the story from austerity to abundance, we can change the story from moral diagnosis to universal floors, which is this idea that no matter what choices you make in your life, no matter what family you're born into, um, no matter what your situation is, there are certain basic human rights that you are um, guaranteed by simply existing on the planet. Um, and we can argue about what those human rights are. I'd suggest that some of them include things like housing, food, family integrity, medical care, um, and a basic standard of living. Right, and one of the arguments we have made is that democracy needs should not be reduced to one person, one vote, because that then um, resorts to the 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 mean uh, um, and the the um, essential needs of the minority are overcome by the trivial needs of the majority. So that emphasis on human rights is also a part of democracy. And we also talk about um, circular full social costing. Um, one of the examples, uh, I, I've been involved in these debates about the uh, measurement of the cost of disability, which a number of uh, jurisdictions are in undergoing. And I was absolutely shocked to notice that the consultants that were hired for the cost estimation were using terms like dead weight. And um, rather than looking at the, the cost of um, the cost and benefits of addressing accessibility and creating an environment where someone with a, that works for someone with a disability. They were instead looking at the cost of disability for the state and therefore we need to prevent or fix disability. So it's, it's a, such a pervasive and ingrained uh, and entrenched mindset. Um, like a minor home renovation that uncovers a rotting foundation, uh, uh, how far back do these problems go? Um, how much of our current cultures and systems do we need to reform before we can reach equitable treatment? Because many of the, the measures that we've seen lately with this buzz about um, inclusion and, uh, and ethical AI just are so surface right now. I, I don't know how long we have to look uh, to go back, but uh, I, but of course uh, uh, we have 
entrenched norms within our institutions and they have a very strong and long lasting uh, legacy. And we have now more, more debates. Some people even say uh, that is, uh, uh, there's a kind of yeah, diversity paradox. So uh, things become a little bit better. Of course, they are incomparable with the situation 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, but more people raise their voice and more people also claim that they want to get access, that they want to be recognized. So I think uh, it's a very good uh, development that we question the, uh, the hidden assumptions of our institutions, our types of provisions, our uh, welfare uh, system, uh, and so on. Uh, in, in order to come to a level where we have equitable uh, uh, treatment uh, or, or even justice, if, if you like, we are not not there, and I think that will be a lo very long way. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, numbers and, and, and counting and algorithms, I think we have to be clear that this is not a technical exercise. And the danger is uh, that it's very easy to just see it as a process of rationalization where some technical experts uh, play their, their role and. Uh, they set up a specific system, but that we understand that it's highly political. I mean, as Virginia uh, said, so we have basically to bring that into the realm of the political, to contest it, to discuss it, to make it part of the public uh, debate. Only then uh, we avoid all the dangers that are associated with them. So of course, the county can also be emancipatory. So it can be also very good, something good because people become visible, uh, people count, as you said, uh, but it could also lead to the opposite. And uh, uh, the opposite uh, uh, has currently a very strong tendency to prevail in my view, uh, given that we have uh, left so much space for private industries to engage in these kind of uh, algorithmic exercise uh, uh, and that the state is basically incapable of uh, doing the same at the same technical uh, level. And therefore, I think we are at risk of losing our political influence as citizens. And uh, so the, what you do here and the discussions you do have uh, are very important, I think, to uh, raise awareness that uh, everything could look uh, different. And I think the question of uh, uh, open codes uh, of algorithms is also a very delicate issue because currently all the firms say so it's basically a, a secret it's our uh, our productivity tool we do not want to make that uh, public and the question from my point of view is uh, is that really justified given that the distribution of life chances depends very much on the way these algorithms are uh, organized and programmed. So um, the answer to how far it goes back raises a funny story for me um, about a fight I had with my editor <laughs> about this book. So um, just quickly, one of the paths I took into this book was that I had, because of some activist and organizing work that I had been doing um, around economic justice and technology, had gotten really interested in the technologies that manage um, technologies uh, of uh, social welfare. And so I live very close to the New York State archives. Um, and so it was like, you know, I'm just going to go find the um, design documents and, and see when they started doing this in, in my own state. So I go to the New York State archives and I'm like guessing when these design documents might have come, might be in the archives. So I'm like, okay, it might be 1996 because in 1996, welfare reform in the United States mandated that offices um, automate some of their eligibility processes. So I look in like 1996. Okay, they were already there. Okay, so it wasn't 1996. So I'm like, okay, maybe it was when the technology became widely available. So that would have been like the late 70s, early 80s. So I go back in the archives, 70s, 80s, it's already there. I'm like, huh. And so I keep going back and back and back in the archives. Um, and I end up uh, in, in the 18 
teens <laughs> um, looking at these, uh, you know, paper algorithms of how to decide the human value of a poor and working class person and like how to decide whether you should just leave them on the street or whether you should offer them some support. So this is in the United States and in other places, this is a very long history. Um, what I will say, and I think the thing that gives us some hope, what I will mention is the point at which um, at least in New York State, the old institutions of the poorhouse became these newer institutions of the digital poorhouse. Because I did find this thing called the National Demonstration Project, which happened in the mid 60s, which was the beginning of the automation of eligibility for um, public assistance in New York State. And it's actually really important to note that that's the moment in our history when this happens, because that is the moment of the absolute highest power um, that the national welfare rights movement ha has, has ever had in the United States. So just a year before they decided to move to this automated system in New York State, 8,000 caseworkers, frontline caseworkers in New York City had walked off the job in a strike not for their own employment contract, but for the rights of their clients. So there's this moment of solidarity across the desk. And that's the moment when the state is like, oh, we need somebody else making these decisions. Um, and that's the moment that they started to rationalize their processes. Because rationalizing our processes is just another way of saying, like firing the humans that are making decisions that we don't like. Um, so the thing that's hopeful about that story is these systems don't change because uh, you know our algorithmic overlords are winning. <laughs> they change when we're winning. They change when the pushback is um, strong enough and effective enough that um, the system becomes unbalanced and they have to shift tactics. You know, if you build a brick and mortar poorhouse, you don't want to just like abandon it unless you're forced to. The problem with the brick and mortar poorhouse was that poor people were getting together and talking about their problems. <laughs> and it created like a wave of revolutionary um, action in the United States. So then, you know what? We're gonna give you uh, help in your home, but we're gonna do this moral diagnosis first. Or like, if you're in your home and you're getting help from a caseworker and the caseworkers are getting too friendly, well, then we're gonna move to another system, right? So these changes in the system are actually markers, I believe that we're winning. Um, and so I think remembering that is really important that these systems change when, um, when the system is out of whack because we are expressing our power. Um, and I think that we can take back these systems if we continue to work, um, do the very difficult work of working across difference to um, attain all of our basic human rights. And taking advantage of the disruptions when um, the, the things are up for questioning. Yeah, I, I actually quite often talk about going right back to Ketele and and uh, the misinterpretation of Darwin as social Darwinism and things like the Pareto principle in economics. So uh, all of these assumptions, the the uh, and you talked about uh, winner takes all game. Um, we are still, I mean, every, all of us are still using words like priority, winning, best, best practice, even in um, many of the interventions that, that we have into inequity. Um, the, I have one last question before we go to the audience questions, and that is um, trying to end on a somewhat more positive note, because it seems like an overwhelming task to to uh, push against many of the, the assumptions and presumptions that are embedded in everything, economics, research, certainly the academy, um, and uh, our, our notions of what is research um, and uh, what, are, what is truth, what is evidence, what is impact, all of those um, are parts of the the same system that uh, we need to question. And that is, what do you think of the promise of community-led, bottom-up, non-parametric metrics as a tool for writing some of the inequities um, that you, you both mentioned, these growing from small successes, the, um, a small community starting to unravel, hopefully, uh, some of the the, the um, inequities that we're seeing. 
I, I don't know exactly because I do not see as many examples of that in, in, in Germany or, or in Europe. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we have an, a number of NGOs who are now engaged in that, like uh, NGO uh, Algorithm Watch. Uh, they're very important, so they, they provide very good uh, reports. And uh, they also had a, a report on uh, the state use of uh, uh, of uh, automatic decision-making techniques uh, all over Europe. So in Poland, uh, UK, France, Belgium, so all countries, it's a very interesting report, unfortunately, only, only in German. Um, uh, but I think, I mean, if, if there is a bottom-up uh, movement uh, to rewrite things, uh, I, I would be very much in favor. I'm probably a little bit more skeptic <laughs> than you because I also see as a global scenery that uh, a lot of things happen. Just l let me mention uh, one, one thing. So I'm currently writing a book on borders and on smart borders too. And uh, uh, what you can see there is that uh, there's a new type of figure emerging that is called trusted traveler, or this is at least how I call it. So that is a traveler uh, that is uh, not only traveling due to his or her passport, uh, but uh, traveling uh, because of a uh, specific risk classification, a positive uh, uh, one uh, yeah, uh, normally. Often because it's an anomaly, it's an anomaly yeah. uh, uh, makes you vulnerable to all sorts of false positives uh, because yeah. you're not recognized, you're seen as a threat. Mm -hmm. And, and for example, Canada, Canada made two years ago a contract uh, with, with China that Chinese citizens, if they apply for a visum uh, for, uh, for, for Canada, can use their CIMA credit score to hand in as a kind of testimony of, of their trustworthiness. And uh, here you have a very interesting exchange between a, a private uh, company credit score and a foreign state agency then allowing on that basis to make decisions about uh, the freedom of movement or the ability to travel uh, to, to Canada or even to other places. And uh, these kind of, uh, of combinations at the global level are very difficult to challenge and to contest. I think at the local level, it's much easier because as a community, people see more clearly what's going on uh, uh, whether uh, so at, at the global or supranational level, it's much more difficult. Uh, I'm happy. I mean, the, the European Union has uh, uh, provided uh, a legal frame now for also for scoring a system for the use of biometrics, uh, but also for data protection. That is quite advanced, and I, I, I hope that uh, some more politicians in other countries they will use it as a role model because uh, not all problems are solved, but I think it's a better regulation than you have in most parts of the world. Yeah, and to your point, um, I, I like to uh, quote Audre Lorde of uh, the master's tools cannot be used to take down the master's house. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about uh, community led, um, finding alternative tools that are not based upon, as you say, the technology. But Virginia, I think you were you were going to say something. Well, yeah, I was going to share that, I, you know, the, about the way I think about hope. Um, so I see hope as a rigorous discipline, <laughs> right? It's not something we have, it's something we do. Um, and um, while I am quite skeptical about the assumptions that are built into many of our systems, and when, while I think that technology is cer certainly not neutral, um, that there are so many, there's so much incredible work happening um, in, in the United States and around the world um, that I think we can um, encourage and nurture these sort of hopeful interventions. So just to give a couple of very quick examples um, from the United States, um, uh, there's a, a a group called M Relief, lowercase m like for mobile relief, um, that tries to ease people's access to things like um, food stamps or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting about M Relief is they come to the work from a different value set rather than being focused on efficiency, anti-fraud and anti-waste, austerity and moral diagnosis. They come from a set of values that come from the welfare rights movement 
So that includes self-determination, autonomy, and dignity. Um, and their tools work completely differently than the, than the tools that the, that the state um, has thus produced and, and has been able to push back on state systems as well. So for example, um, you only need one household member who is a citizen in order to be eligible for food stamps, so SNAP um, in the United States, food assistance in the United States. How the state of California was uh, determining that in its paperwork was by asking for a list of all the members in the household and then asking for all of their social security numbers. M relief, when they were trying to create um, um, an easier connection to services um, in California, noticed that this was not actually policy relevant information. And they pushed back on the state of California. They said, you don't have to collect that. You don't need a social security number for everybody in the household. All you need to know is that one person in the household is a citizen. And so you should only ask like, is there one citizen in the house? If so, what is their social security number? And they pushed back and forced California to change the way they were doing their application process. Um, so there are all kinds of ways um, to intervene um, in, in these um, programs. Another that I'll mention very quickly is the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, has a new sort of a group that is part of their national organizing work called um, National Domestic Workers Alliance Labs, um, which has done a lot of work, particularly during um, the pandemic, to collect really important data about domestic workers who are often one of those groups who are completely undercounted, um, underrecognized, and because of that made very vulnerable to exploitation and violence. So there are all kinds of ways that we can intervene in the systems to make things better for the people in our communities. And your perspectives on all of these are, I, I think, quite um, useful at the moment because Canada in its throne speech announced a disability benefit. And it seems that our government and the, the um, consultants are simply looking at what of a choice of, of previous practices um, should apply to this disability benefit. And there is a group that is looking to move beyond that to paint a different picture of the economic um, based by people with disabilities. So I, I want to now move to um, the questions from the audience and I'll ask Vera to um, uh, highlight some of the, the questions that are there. And uh, I don't know if both of you are potentially available after our um, webinar ends to answer some of the questions that are there that we don't get to so that uh, we capture some of the responses. Um, I know that you, your time is valuable, so you may not be able to do that, but if possible, that would that would be great. So Vera, I, I turn it over to you. Oh, okay, and uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy for um, panelists to open up the Q&A and select questions that particularly appeal to them. Um, and now, I, 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 perhaps in a more just world, I would go in order, but I think I'm going to jump the queue um, and move to a question from, uh, oh, let's go with Jonathan Brown because he made me look up words. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, Jonathan says, um, you know, our presenter set the stage well, and I'm wondering how the circular economy and social justice will avoid the pitfalls of algorithmic bias. Can science and evidence decision making lead to a, and Yuta, you should do these for me because they're German words, <laughs> I think. Gemmenschaft? As opposed, no, do, you saw it. Gemeinschaft. Gemeinschaft, as opposed to a data driven Gesellschaft? Gesellschaft. Oh, I tried. <laughs> Anyone uh, want to try to take on that? I'm going to have to look up those words. <laughs> I, I saw <laughs> in, uh, um, in the chat. I'm going to have to go back and look in the chat. I'm going to let Stefan go first because uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I know the words, but I have probably no proper answer to, to that question. And uh, so, um, Gemeinschaft is more a commonness, and Gesellschaft is togetherness, I guess, um, data driven togetherness. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it I, all 
Yeah. I think I think I mean if 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 you had tight tight relationships and you live in a community, it's more a type of Gemeinschaft. Whereas a division of labor, rationalization, this is a Gesellschaft, society uh, and community. Uh, it's uh, commonly uh, translated, and uh, and of course the the, the question is. Uh, uh, whether science and evidence can lead more to a kind of community rather than to society. Uh, I mean, as I said before, I'm a little bit on the skeptic uh, side, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so I think, I mean, Jutta made a few points, uh, uh, at least uh, highlighting that there are ideas around, that there are initiatives uh, around, that is, uh, things can also move forward, so I would not uh, deny that. And I, I think this is the only chance uh, we have that we basically reacquire uh, our community uh, uh, competence so that we really say we take back control, we take back decision making. Uh, we are not uh, uh, techno skeptic, if you like, so we are not against uh, algorithms at all. Uh, but we want to have them embedded in uh, in the community, and we want to have uh, a say in how they look like, uh, what they do, where they work, and where they don't work. And till now, I think these kind of uh, re-embedding of uh, algorithmic uh, techniques has not uh, yet happened, or at least to a very low uh, degree. And I think this is something uh, one should uh, work on, because the more localized an uh, algorithm is, the more contextualized uh, it, uh, it can become. And I think this is very decisive because most algorithms, they are really, uh, they work ac across, uh, so nationwide and are applied everywhere. And I think this is a problem because the standardization effect is uh, the higher, uh, uh, the, the more across the board you apply it. And, uh, to come to a local level uh, could probably ease the problem a little bit, or maybe even uh, uh, at a moderate level. Yeah, and I think that uh, we within the academy are to blame here. Research are to, are to blame. I mean, the the favored research methods, whether it's CRT or um, any other quantified an analytics, is assumes that you have a homogeneous population within a clean lab. And we lose the context, we lose uh, the uniqueness and the diversity. Uh, so the AI is automating, accelerating and amplifying that. Um, so, and this leads to the question of, I, I think an associated question is if we want to change either within research or within AI practices or within um, uh, welfare benefits, this, do we do it within or do we do it, um, or do we create an, an alternative model that is outside of the institution or outside of, of where uh, these things are happening? And then at what point does that become reintegrated? Can we make the change from within or, can, or do we need to, as uh, some of the examples that Virginia produced or, or talked about, um, uh, can, do we need to do it outside of the, the system? There are a couple of questions around algorithms that, uh, you know, mostly I think asking for your insights and thoughts on uh, open algorithms and community driven algorithms, and even um, also thinking about um, transparency and definitions of uh, algorithms, you know, mechanisms for transparency within algorithms. Any, any comments around those? I'd like I'd like to take that, um, and and then I want to connect it to Cybele's question too about computers taking care of the easy mm -hmm. stuff instead of the um, the hard stuff, the sort of low hanging fruit algorithm, um, because I think that's a really important and interesting mm -hmm. question. So I think there's been a lot of focus in um, sort of AI ethics around transparency and accountability. Um, I think trans transparency is, of course, crucial, um, and I think there are some real issues around transparency that open algorithms may solve. But I'll say from my own reporting and my own organizing work um, and my own experience that in things like the public assistance system, 
Um, the the non-public assistance receiving public generally will be perfectly happy with you openly and transparently screwing poor people. Um, and so there is really only so far that openness and transparency goes when it's reinforcing um, a value that harms. Um, I mean, in the United States, um, poor and working class people aren't even a minority, but like um, a, a marginalized population. Um, so there's some limitations to just focusing on openness and transparency, though, of course, it's a really crucial piece of the puzzle of figuring out how these systems are shifting our politics and shifting our relationships to each other. Um, and on um, Cybele's really good question about, which I'll just read quickly for folks. Um, what do you think, um, oh, it just disappeared. Come back, there it is. What do you think of the idea of computers taking care of the easy stuff instead of the hard stuff? So for example, algorithms that automate the process of very low hanging fruit so that humans can focus more on the complex cases rather than tasking computers to decide the complex ones. Um, and that's a really important question. So, and I think that there are situations in which that makes perfect sense. I mean, weather prediction, like, like let's not do that on paper, right? Like let's, let's let that, let's let that, that, their algorithms are very helpful in predicting weather. Um, but I found in my reporting and in my research um, that um, though administrators often said that's what they were doing, they said, oh, we're going to take like processing this huge amount of information away from our frontline caseworkers so they can really concentrate on like really being a resource to families that in reality, that's not what was happening on the ground. On the ground, what was happening is like um, a routinization of very human work um, that then became a rationalization for removing those workers from the system. Um, so if you look, the, I think the best, the clearest example is probably um, Uber and automated driving cars, right? So it's clear that Uber drivers are training the models that are gonna be used for automated cars. So they are training themselves out of a, a, a job in some ways. Um, and I had many, many caseworkers say that to me, that they were very, very aware that what was happening is they were training a technical system that was probably gonna replace them. And they were incredibly concerned about that because they saw that they did not see their job as frontline caseworkers, the folks who had been around for a while, did not see their job as um, managing and um, analyzing information they saw their job as being present through trauma with people who needed human support. And their concern was that the technical systems were actually shifting the definition of the job away from that kind of um, more holistic human support to um, this system of information processing. And then once you've defined casework as information processing, then of course computers do it better than people. Um, but they were aware, they knew that, they know this. Like they, they're very concerned about the shift in the, um, in the job. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there is an argument to be made that it is possible to root not, to, to um, digitize some routine tasks, but then what that looks like once the rubber really hits the road, once you really figure out what's gonna happen to people on the ground, that sometimes can look really complicated and really troubling. Yeah, another vicious cycle. I often use that Uber example to talk about what we're doing within education. I, I think we're training uh, the, with the emphasis on STEM, with the emphasis on formulaic instructional tutors, we're preparing st our students to be replaced by automation um, because they are, um, anyway, so this, that's a tangent. Um, the, um, one, one question, the, the top question, um, Deborah, uh, Kaplan asked, she's pointing out this issue of the, the enormity of the task of pushing against this uh, from a community bottom-up uh, approach and the, the um, disparity in terms of wealth and resources that uh, a small community that is critiquing this would have in comparison with the large um, tech industry. So uh, I, I wonder whether there's any hopefulness there or where can uh, these community led uh, 
where m much of the disability community lives below the poverty line. So how, how do we address that type of disparity so that we can obtain more hope? I want to say one very short thing, which is like, and they also said it's impossible to abolish the police, but we're going to try to do that too, <laughs> right? Like these huge systems aren't infallible, like they're not infallible. And there, you know, there are cities in the United States that have banned facial recognition. There's, you know, there, this work is happening. I think it, it is easy to become hopeless, to be, become overwhelmed by it until you engage, engage in the communities that are actually doing this work. Um, and it's happening all over the country and all over the world in ways that like inspire me on a, on a sort of, a, on a daily basis. So I think there's tons of hope. I, I will be the Pollyanna here. Great. And Vera, do you have, um, do you want to highlight any? I'll, I'll pick another question. Um, I'm gonna choose the one from Henry uh, Claypool. He asks, are there a set of principles that might be followed in algorithmic development to empower disabled people. The goals of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, say, are that all people with disabilities have equality of opportunity, economic self-sufficiency, full participation in American life and independent living. This might serve as a starting point. Might this be a productive place to start? So uh, I, any thoughts on that? That's a toughie. Yeah, I mean, if I, I probably repeat myself, but of course, those concerned and those affected by uh, algorithmic decision making uh, should be part uh, of the writing team. And only then, of course, you are able to take care of their needs and uh, their specific uh, situation. Uh, very often, this is simply not done because people have a certain image of the world outside. They sit down and try to make good decisions. It's not that they all have bad intentions. Uh, but of course, they do not really know what uh, life situations of others uh, may uh, look like or, or look like. Uh, I think there's always an inherent problem uh, when you want to do business with algorithm, uh, algorithms. It's uh, so you, uh, you should have an algorithm that is as general as possible to be applied everywhere. Uh, but if you look from a community level, then of course it should be as specific as possible. So relating to the context, it is used, uh, think of uh, algorithms for e-recruiting. So the pre-sorting of, uh, of applications. Then of course, uh, the business case would be uh, basically to have that used in any firm that is recruiting personnel. Uh, then it becomes uh, so standardized that it cannot cater for specific needs neither of the firm nor of the applicants. And I think this is a, this is a big problem. So if you then write an algorithm that is uh, used in a community, I don't know, with 40,000 or 5,000 uh, people, then you cannot make a big profit out of it. And this kind of tension uh, is inherent in all uh, developments uh, of, uh, of these kind of decision-making uh, algorithms. And how, what can we do about that? Uh, for example, that there are fundings at the community level to allow uh, the adoption uh, or uh, the, the reshaping of algorithms according to the local uh, needs. This is very often not been done. So it simply used uh, uh, full skill, the same type everywhere. But if we could have public resources for that, that of course, that could be also a very interesting business case to be able to adjust uh, your own algorithm to a specific local context. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this would be something uh, as, as, as a politician or public servant, I would think about uh, much, uh, much more because then the, the writing of the algorithm uh, would uh, also look different because right at the beginning, they would think that uh, these things have a baby basically a, a, a standard core, but they have also uh, the, 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 the ability uh, to write local applications uh, of that. And I think that would be a move forward already. Yeah, I think it, it also needs to go be, uh, beyond just localization. One of the, the um, from a data perspective, people with disabilities only have one common data point, which is a sufficient difference from the average or norm. 
uh, that things don't work for you. So they are, um, individuals with disabilities have very, very diverse requirements and needs, especially with the AI decision-making. So I think it, it, it actually also goes beyond algorithms um, to questioning the process of machine learning and then go back to um, how we determine, how we make decisions in general, even without AI, um, because AI is just, uh, as Virginia pointed out, um, intensifying, um, accelerating, amplifying, automating uh, those particular processes which are uh, biased against minorities. Uh, even issues like scaling, um, when we talk about scaling, we talk about formulaic replication of a single thing and applying it uh, globally. But I, I, I love the, the point that you're making. We need to localize it. will benefit everybody to um, be able to look at the diverse instances of the algorithmic decisions. But I think it needs to go even further than that um, to potentially on-device systems where you, ha um, you have the data comes from you you have algorithmic decisions and then you share it amongst your community. So I see that Henry's jumped off, but I, I just wanna say one thing about this, which is I think that the principles of the independent living movement and the disability rights movement at, as represented in the ADA are actually some really, really crucial and important principles um, that, um, that should we should be keeping sort of um, at, the, at the front of our thinking when we're thinking about these systems, because what I find so useful about them um, is the focus on dignity, autonomy, um, and interdependent independence. Um, I think um, that those principles are so crucial and we don't see them often in the kind of organizing that we're doing around these systems, certainly not in the design of many of these systems. Um, but we are also at a moment, at least in the United States, um, I don't know how it is in Canada, where um, there are a lot of challenges around these systems on um, ADA grounds. Um, so there's challenges, for example, to what an accommodation means. Mm -hmm. Like, does an accommodation mean that you have to have an in-person hearing, that you have to physically appear before a judge? And like, what is the accommodation in that case? If you really struggle with mobility, maybe it is an accommodation for you to have a virtual hearing. But if all of the hearings are virtual, there's a lot that's lost, a lot of information that's lost that a judge might be able to um, take into account if they were physically in the same room with you, right? So there are gonna be a lot of challenges around these sort of basic principles of the ADA um, that I think yeah. we really um, need to keep an eye on. I'm sorry, what's yeah. that? accommodation which which assumes that there is an inaccessible system and you are, are the exception that needs something else as opposed to offering everyone a spectrum of possibilities and choices without having to ask for that exception uh, I, I I hate to have to bring our questioning to an end because uh, there's lots of questions in the queue um, but uh, we are uh, going to run out of time, both from our um, uh, captions and ASL uh, time, as well as our, our, our Zoom time. So, <laughs> so what I will say is that um, I think we can try to, I'll try to take these questions and put them into the, on the WeCount website and see if people have an opportunity to answer or want to answer um, or start some discussion. So in the, where we have um, this, uh, um, initiative on the website. We'll we'll add these things to to allow us some conversation there. Um, and so I wanted to just let you know that I, I would like you to have any closing remarks now uh, that you would want to have um, before we end. And I'll turn it over to Virginia and Stephanie. I just want to thank people for being here and for engaging in the conversation, um, Stefan and Yuta for sure, but also everyone who, um, the, you know, 60 people who are still in the audience there. Um, thank you so much for your time, your attention, your great questions, um, and hope to be able to continue the conversation. Yeah, it's the same from my side. So thanks for inviting me and uh, also the, the conversations, all the questions. Sorry that we did not answer all of them. Uh, I think it's an extremely important topic, uh, and uh, if we, as also I'm a social, social scientist, but also all other disciplines, 
contribute somehow to making the things better than they are at the moment. I think the, the world <laughs> overall would look better. So uh, maybe this is a take home message uh, and hope to see you somewhere at some place. Yeah, and I'm hoping that we can somehow continue this conversation. And also I, I send my thanks to both of our panelists for giving us this valuable time and the audience for sticking around actually well after the, the time period and especially to the team that has pulled um, all the aspects of this talk together. Thank you. And I, I hope we'll find many opportunities to continue. Me too. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, uh, as, you, as you exit, we are showing a, a little bit of a, a video about how you can earn We Count badges and participate in learning. David, I think you were going to share your screen. Thank you to everyone for participating. We had your screen and then we lost it, David. What is a We Count Challenge? To achieve WeCount's goal of an inclusive and balanced data ecosystem for persons with disabilities, WeCount is issuing an ongoing call for challenges. A WeCount challenge is a data ecosystem inclusion problem that creates barriers to participation or other risks from things like exclusion from datasets, ableism and bias in data systems, inaccessible data science tools, data abuse, and misuse. We Count is providing opportunities for stakeholders to raise and address data ecosystem challenges, especially those that impact people with disabilities. Some challenges have already been submitted by We Count collaborators, including Create data sets that help identify barriers to employment, such as a lack of accessible washrooms at workplaces. Effectively share information on elevator operation status for all elevators. Collect data on screen reader interoperability to improve accessibility. To tackle these challenges, WeCount is assembling diverse, knowledgeable teams for challenge workshops. We want to hear from you. Nominate a data ecosystem inclusion challenge on the WeCount website, sign up for upcoming WeCount initiatives, and follow us on social media. WeCount is funded by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and is supported by the Accessible Technology Program of Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. What is? I, uh, I I think I said that was a badge video, but that's about we count challenges, um, and we're interested in exploring challenges from our um, from the you know people out there in the world, not just from the research team for the project. So please do submit your challenges. We also have opportunity, and we count to uh, earn badges and micro credentials. Um, Webinars like this are an opportunity to earn a learner badge, and you can go to our website to learn more about them. There's going to be one for this badge uh, or for this webinar, but we have ones from other webinars that you may have missed, and you can watch the videos and uh, do some learning. And maybe in some cases, we have opportunities to collaborate as well, so you can earn other badges too. And I, that concludes our program for today. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, for making these webinars as interesting and uh, as they are. Uh, I love all the questions.